What's going on everybody? It's Jazzy CEO back with another video, but this time it's a little bit of a story time. So before we get started, make sure when you are done with this video, you head to my playlist called Industry Talk Podcast and check out the latest episode of Industry Talk Podcast. We dive into domestic violence, peace orders, protection orders, and etc. But this video is pertaining to that but it's specifically geared towards my private detective and process service when it pertains to protective restraining or peace orders. Now, you may be wondering, are there differences between those three, three, in, those three things or what, what do you need to do? So here's what I have. Or you might be asking, why would a protective order or peace order or restraining order be something that a process server or investigator needs? So now let's get to the story before I even tell you that, because you might be able to answer your own question. All right. Hmm. Long, long time ago. No. Okay. So as a process server, I've been doing this for about four years, maybe going on five. Right. And I had this one law firm client who um, their client was suing a major CEO in the city that I live in. This major CEO had instructed their staff in their office and their assistant to not accept paperwork from the court or to say he's not there or to say he's not available on the phone or just ducking and dodging, right? So being the great investigator I am, I figure out his home address. Now, that's another video on how I got that. You gotta hit me up for some training. But I figured out the home address through some clues that he actually put out. And once I got the home address, I served him at his home address, which seems regular because you see process server videos all the time or investigator stuff all the time. They're staking out someone's house or they're serving at the house or the home, right? Yeah, you're correct. It's regular. There's no law saying that I can't serve him at his residence. Now, he might have wanted me not to come to his residence because, of course, his wife and his kids are there, but that's none of my business. So, nevertheless... I do end up serving this individual, and a week later, I get a phone call from my client, which is the law firm, and they're like, yeah, such and such has called several times trying to get your information, trying to see how they could go about, about suing you for um, coming to his home without permission, and let's just pause right there. Whose permission was I supposed to get, sir? Yours? You may be the big man on campus at your company, you're the CEO of your company, but you don't run the legal system. And there's nothing legally saying that I can't serve you at your home. I didn't obtain the information illegally. I didn't do anything to harm you. So if someone actually threatens you with that when you serve them, just know that unless your state has a law against serving court documents at people's residence, which I've never seen that before, then you're fine and don't be scared by those scare tactics. But he continued to try to figure out my information. Now, I was a young server back then, and I made a couple mistakes, okay? So on the affidavit, I did things like use my full name, use my address, I had my personal cell phone, my personal email. Like, I was just trying to give my information where it asked for my information. Lo and behold, now, if the court papers are turned into the courts, Sometimes the defendant will be able to see that paperwork, you know, through their lawyer or through whatever. And you have to be very mindful of those things. So nowadays I do a few things. I use a 1-800 number for my company. I use a PO box. I use Private Detective Lee on all my paperwork. I don't put my real name unless I'm signing my signature and my handwriting is really bad. So the signature is like a doctor's. You can't really read it anyway. And if you do, you deserve to find out the information. But I try to put those things in place to keep me from going through that. Now, it didn't get really bad. He did end up stopping after a while, probably because he talked to legal counsel and they were like, hey, buddy, there's no such thing as this thing that you're talking about that prohibits her from coming to your home. Now, of course, I was nice and I was polite and I actually have it on camera. But because he was such a problem, I won't be posting that. But anyway, so with that being said, if you're an investigator or you're a process server who is experiencing that kind of thing or worse, because I'm really talking about worse because I didn't really feel harassed. It was kind of cool that he was so mad at me because the law firm started to use me and give my information out to other law firms because I got somebody that other process servers couldn't get. That's because I treat every process server like a full-fledged investigation and I do my due diligence. But 
If you have an individual that is showing up at your home, showing up at your P.O. box, that's calling you, emailing you, harassing you because they're upset that you served them, then there's a few things you can do. Now, in the beginning of this video, I mentioned my latest podcast because it was on domestic violence. And one of the things that I gave survivors of domestic violence um, to do was afterwards, you know, if you haven't done it during or before, but when you do get the strength to leave, make a paper trail. Because if you end up having to defend yourself, you want something that's on record that says, I've tried all my other ways and now I bopped them upside the head. Okay, I'm not condoning any violence, but I'm just saying paper trails are lovely. Video is lovely. So paper trail in this case and in that case would be something like a peace order, a restraining order, or a protective order. Now in different states, the depending on the situation, you qualify for different orders. In Maryland state, where I am, peace order and protection order are two different things, but protection order and restraining order are basically the same thing, right? So I'm no lawyer, but I'm just giving you the gist. So what I want to do is run down some things that you have to prove that this individual is doing to you in order to get a peace order or a protective order. So one thing you wanna do is, yes, I have notes for you guys. You want to make sure that you can prove an act that caused serious bodily harm, you want to make sure that you can prove an act that placed you in fear or imminent harm. Um, you have to prove assault in a, any degree, rape or sexual offense, attempted rape or sexual offense, false imprisonment, criminal stalking, revenge porn. These might not apply to you, but these are the things that you have to prove in order to get um, a protective order. Now for a peace order, you have to prove criminal harassment, criminal trespassing, malice destruction of property, misuse of telephone facilities and equipment, misuse of electronic communication or interactive computer services or visual surveillance. Now that might have something more to do with the situation as far as a private detective or a process server. So that's for a peace order. And the other one is for a protective order. And you may actually qualify for protective order if you're receiving that kind of harassment too. But it's really up to the judge. And you just have to make your, sure you do your due diligence by getting what you need to prove that this person is doing this. Keeping all the emails, text messages, phone calls, documenting every time you see them, where, what, where you were, what you were doing. Just make sure you have a plethora of proof and evidence so that you can get what you need because if it comes down to you defending yourself you definitely want to have a paper trail so that's my little tip on when people get upset that you have served them y'all stay safe out there